please turn, if you would, in your copy of God's Holy Word to the 85th Psalm, Psalm 85. Tonight we have a topical sermon on the theme of revival. This won't be a a preaching of the entirety of the psalm, but particularly verse 6, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? I've preached on the entirety of the psalm some time ago, but we will focus our energy here. Uh, The sermon that I preached uh, at the prayer meeting before the synod is largely based on what you will hear, though that was more pointed at the elders and the sins of the ministry. Um, But uh, today we will consider more broadly this theme of our need to seek revival. So trusting you're at Psalm 85, please give now uh, your attention to the reading of God's word. Psalm 85, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Amen. Let us now pray for the preaching of the word. Our Father and our God, We pray for the preaching of the word, most especially that you might use it in the day of small things to bring about a great revival amongst the people of God. Father, none of us here have experienced uh, days of revival when it seemed like the days that heaven had come to earth with the presence of the Lord. But we know you have done this before. And you can do it again. And so in the preaching of the word, we pray that you would give us a desire for God. That we would desire God to come down more than anything. And so we pray, Father, that you would enable me to preach in a manner that Christ is lifted up. That the people would desire him over all other things. And that they would desire that the world, that the land would be revived. That the church would be revived first and foremost. And so to that end, Father, to the glory of Christ, we pray that you'd let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, as I have mentioned already, our theme tonight deals with the topic of revival. And what the church today does not seem to realize is that we are greatly in need of being revived. That things are not okay. And I don't mean, you know, often when you tell somebody in the church things are not okay, they're they're pointing the fingers at the White House or they're pointing the finger to the Congress. No, things are not okay in the church is the problem. We need to be revived. We don't realize because, you know, we live in a fishbowl, so to speak. And most of us, what we have experienced of the church is all we know of the church. But we are at a very low point, historically speaking. And we may go even lower. That the need of the church of Jesus Christ is truly to seek revival, that the church would be revived. Now, I'm aware that this is a loaded and perhaps unpopular expression today, especially in the Reformed Church, and so we need education as well as exhortation when it comes to revival. And so before we go too far to seeking revival, today in our theme of seeking revival, I want to consider three heads The first is a definition of revival. Second is a desire for revival. And third is the determination that God would give us revival. And those are the three heads on your bulletin. So first head here is definition. So in this first head, 
I would like us to consider a definition of revival. And it is my hope that having a proper definition will give us a desire for it, which will then lead us to a determination to pursue it. Because the devil has been quite successful in obliterating the true knowledge of revival, such that Reformed Christians are often ashamed to speak of revival today. And in fact, there are Reformed men who will speak against revival, that revival is not something that we need or should seek. Why is that? Well, because today this word revival has been associated with crazed and unbiblical revivalist meetings, where you imagine people are rolling around on the ground in a tent after some emotionalism uh, from the the so-called preacher who is preaching there and with the music causing a kind of movement in people to sort of force them psychologically to respond in a way. And those meetings carry a sense that men control revival and can have them begin on cue. They will have a tent saying, revival today. That's not how revival works at all. That is not true biblical revival. That is the legacy of Finneyism, Charles Finney. And it is a species of psychological manipulation. That is a forgery of revival That is a forgery of the work of the Holy Ghost. Just as in the Old Testament, we were prohibited from creating a forgery of the anointing oil, which pictured the work of the Holy Ghost. So too are we prohibited from creating these forgeries of revival. So then if revivalist meetings are a forgery, we might ask, what is a legitimate revival? Well, our psalm teaches it because revival is the theme of the 85th Psalm. Its central verse, its sixth verse, pleads with God, Wilt thou not revive us again? And this one verse is extremely helpful in creating a definition of what revival is. Because the Hebrew word for revive signifies revival from a grievous sickness, almost as though you were at the death's doorstep. Think of CPR, boys and girls. You know, we speak of reviving a person, right, who is about to die. And so the subjects of revival here have to do with those who have some spiritual life. These are not the unconverted. These are not those who are dead in their sins and trespasses. You cannot revive the dead. They are dead. They need to be regenerated. That's not revival. Regeneration is not revival. It's in Psalm 85 that we find the believer who says, revive us again. It is the church that believes, that says, revive us again. Now, this word revive, the Hebrew word, uh, fittingly in the scripture, speaks of not just reviving the body, but also the soul, about reviving the spirit. Uh, Consider the patriarch Jacob, which is fitting as we have sung of Jacob in this 85th Psalm. You remember Jacob's trials. In Genesis 42, you find him with a brutally bereaved spirit. He said to his sons, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not and Simeon is not and ye will take Benjamin away. He said, all these things are against me. Later in Genesis 4, so that's the man's spirit. Genesis 45, 27, we read that Jacob's heart was faint and made feeble. The man's life itself lacked vitality. His soul was being crushed, not from a bodily affliction, but he felt that all these things were against me. And I suppose you've probably been in a state where at times your spirit is so crushed, you almost feel as though you're going to die. But then when Jacob heard the words of his son Joseph, what do we read next? The spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Right? Vitality returns. His life, which seemed sick and even at death's doorstep, found vitality. It was revived. And I think it is so fitting in the scripture that Jacob's affliction and his revival serves as a great illustration of the effect of revival on the church, the Israel of God. For in revival, what happens is the Lord takes his people that are spiritually feeble, lethargic and weak. And what does he do? He breathes new life into them. They are revived. He breathes spiritual vitality into them. What is diseased is quickened. What is ready to die is revived. In a Sword and Trowel article, Charles Spurgeon defined revival like this. To be revived is a blessing which can only be enjoyed by those who have some degree of life. 
Those who have no spiritual life are not and cannot be, in the stricted sense of the term, the subjects of a revival. So revival is not conversion, he's, is what he's teaching here. Many blessings may come to the unconverted in consequence of a revival among Christians, but the revival itself has to do only with those who already possess spiritual life. There must be vitality in some degree before there can be a quickening of vitality, or in other words, a revival. The sad fact is, what the 85th Psalm shows us, is that we who are spiritually alive are often in need of revival. You know, we can be cold for the Lord. We can feel as though the Lord is far from us. We can find that we really don't care about the things of God. We can have true saving interest in Christ, and the church just doesn't care about Christ very much. And that is precisely the point of the 85th Psalm. You know, why is this psalm, you know, we are psalm singers. Why is the psalm given to us to sing? We can ask the question. Because God's people very often, until he returns, will need to be revived. And will need to know how to cry out to God for it. That they must cry out to God and they must even praise him so that they would be revived. When revival comes, God comes down into his church is what happens. You know, when Father and Son pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, uh, we find revival. You know, God is present with his church. I trust he's present with us, but his presence comes in a heightened way in revival. It's almost like his presence is palpable. This is what the church is to plead for. Uh, The 80th Psalm, the 14th verse says, Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. Right? We want him to visit us. Right? God is always with his vineyard in a way. Right? But we want him in a heightened way to visit us. We cry out in Isaiah 64, Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence, as when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. The presence of God comes and people tremble. Isn't that what we read of in 1 Corinthians 14, where the presence of God comes into the assembly and even the unbeliever is shaken to his core? God is among them of a truth. And that's our desire in revival. Come down, O God, visit us in a heightened way. Dwell with us, revive us. But what you find about revival is though it begins with the church, it overflows out of the church into our land. And that's the blessed effect of revival. Uh, Duncan Campbell, who witnessed the 20th century Lewis revival, summed it up this way. Revival, and I think this is a beautiful description, revival is a community saturated with God. God is on the mind of the community. That is eminently scriptural, if not experiential. What do we ask for in revival? The ninth verse says that glory may dwell in our land. Right, The glory of God coming to dwell with us and His presence overflowing into our land. And as the presence of God pours into the church and overflows into the community, with His presence, what comes? Right, uh, what, his, Does His presence bring disorder and chaos? No. His presence comes with a sense of the holiness of God. A sense of His awe and majesty. And with it brings what? A conviction of sin. Conversion from death to life and an overflowing of love for Jesus. True love, a desire to live for him first and foremost, that he is the first love of the people and a need to devote ourselves to him and his cause. It's having first place, right? Does that sound anything like the church today? Even the church here at Dallas RPC. I suppose there's some of that here, but not like it is in times of revival. Consider the effects of the Great Awakening when the Holy Ghost came down through Whitfield's preaching. Now, Benjamin Franklin, of all people, right, of all people, wrote this in his autobiography, quote, It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing what? Psalms sung in different families of every street. This is what happens. Benjamin Franklin Adia sees it. He sees that with Whitfield's preaching now comes a change in the manners of society itself. That people are not better, but they're religious. 
that they adore Christ and they sing his psalms. You ask the question, was there religion in the colonies before Whitfield came? Yes. Was it sick? Yes. But then revival comes and spiritual vitality comes with it. And God became everything to those areas that the Great Awakening reached. For all of the problems with the Great Awakening, right? there is still clearly a work of God in a mighty way. Well, you think about, as we plead for the presence of God, what did Jesus say the work of the Holy Ghost is? To reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, John 16, 8. And that is what you see in revival. Right? You don't see lunacy. You see men struck with the holiness of God. Jonathan Edwards preaches right in revival. He preaches sinners in the hands of an angry God. And people are weeping. He can't even finish the sermon. People are weeping over a sense of their sin. And it's not manipulation. He has preached that sermon before. But God came down at the appointed hour. And you find that the people weep. Because when God comes, a true godliness that pierces the heart and changes the walk comes. Right? Men and women mourn when revival comes that they have pierced Christ. Even the converted begin to weep. They become more spiritually sensitive. The slightest of their sins causes them to mourn. But they also cling to Jesus with tears of joy. Just as the bride did after she awoke from her lethargy in the Song of Solomon as we heard at the communion season. In revival, Christ is near to the mind and to the heart of the people. And the theme of the nation is religion. True religion. It's not sports games. It's not the latest Netflix series. It is God on the mind of the people. It is God who is near. And a sense of God's holiness permeates the community. There's a burning uh, desire found in the heart for the righteousness that exalteth a nation, right? One of the things that we often see will never prosper uh, in, in a land like ours right now is simply to say, you know what we need is we need a change of laws to righteousness. This is the theonomy, right? Uh, the theonomy idea is that if we just have the right laws on the books, then things will go okay. Now, I, I am completely sympathetic to having righteous laws. Don't get me wrong. But what we need first is God to be on the heart so that the people cry out, I want righteousness in the nation. And it comes from the heart. And a burning desire for God will lead to the sense of the weight and joy of eternity. There is a palpable love for Christ. His gospel that proclaims the full and free salvation from sin in Jesus is the joy of the people. They're taken up by it. And a desire for the salvation of the lost accompanies weeping for souls that we know that are going astray and don't know Christ. Right? We are pricked in the heart to know that loved ones and friends or even the person down the street is going to hell. We have a sense of the weight of eternity. Now as we are covenanters, uh, we believe that men, nations, and churches are obligated to covenant to be the Lord's. And you have to see where does covenanting come from. It is the product of revival. When people desire God. Prophesied of in Jeremiah 50 verses 4 and 5. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Out of the heart, then, men, nations, and churches bind themselves to the Lord and to one another. In Scotland, did we not see such an outpouring when the National Covenant and the Solemn League and Covenant were pursued by ordinary men and women with as much vigor, sometimes more, than the ministers and elders as covenanters, then, we ought never forget the word revival. It is part of our spiritual DNA. What moves men and women to sign a covenant in their own blood? It's because their hearts are revived. And all they can see is God, Christ, must be uh, glorified in my home, in my nation, and in my life. So revival, and I could preach on and on about this first heading, but uh, we have other things to consider today. What a picture that is. Right? In a sense, you have a foretaste of heaven come to earth in revival. And that ought to really be our desire, shouldn't it? That God would come down and be with us. 
And so having seen a picture or a definition of revival, let us now consider desire for it as our second head. And I would ask the question, as we think on our desire for it, don't we need revival in our time and in our place, brethren? When you think of what revival is and you look at our present state, we are really much like God's people in the 85th Psalm. I'm thankful to God that this is a picture of a people yet revived and not of a people who are revived in many ways because we are given this psalm to take and plead with the Lord with great desire that he might give what he has promised. We are much like the people of God in the 85th Psalm, and we are to lament the state of religion. We must thirst and hunger for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit that we have known in times past but do not presently know. The people say that we once felt his pleasure. We had once been so near. God had been near to us. But their lament in verse 4 is now what? They sensed his displeasure. Cause thine anger toward us to cease. And you have to see here, these are a people God had saved who lamented that they felt his anger. You know, thing is, friends, we're often insensible to the anger of God to his people, which is often very much the case that God is displeased with us anyhow, because we are insensible to his anger. You know, one of the things that no one wants to say anymore is God is angry with his church. I don't know how you can look at the state of the church and not say that God is not pleased, at least with the church in America. Can there be a doubt that the Lord has controversies with us, brethren, in both church and state? Are we that insensible? Do we really think that we have religion in our heart and our mind as we ought to, even just considering the pastors of the land? You know, our land, for all her deficiencies, once enjoyed great outpourings of the Holy Spirit. But now look at us. Would you just open your eyes and pray, God have mercy on us. This month we celebrate perversions in our so-called Pride Month. Our people are so confused, so blinded in their minds that they do not know what constitutes male or female. On the Supreme Court sits one of the nine most supposedly wise people of the land who says she cannot define a woman for you. This is wisdom in the nation. Our White House now flies as a symbol of our nation, the pride flag, celebrating Sodom's values as American values. Well, what of the church? You know, it's very easy to point our fingers at the heathen. But what about the church? You know, and it's very easy to preach against the sins out there. But where God's people don't want to hear it is when it is our sins. But judgment begins in the house of God. Do we not need revival? Yes, You think about this. So much of the church doesn't even know the gospel. Can't even articulate it to you. So much of the church has ceased to preach against sin. So much of the church no longer preaches simply the glory of God. So much of the church does not preach the mercies of a crucified Savior, and men are deluded thinking their works are saving them. So much of the church does not care that souls are going to hell outside their walls, and they won't tell people outside their walls that they are going to hell if they don't go to Christ. God's people in our land need a revival of religion that permeates their bones because our bones seem about as dry as the bones in Ezekiel's vision. But also, as Reformed Christians, do we not need a revival in our own midst? As Reformed Presbyterian Christians, don't we need revival? Are we really satisfied with the state of things in our own midst? And I hope not. You know, our synod's docket and digest caused many of us to weep. Or you can read Ligonier's State of Theology surveys. And you cannot be satisfied, but instead feel shamed. If we had any spiritual sensibility, right, at all of these things, we would have rivers of water running down our eyes over the state of the church. We ought to be like Jeremiah in many ways over where we are, asking the Lord to revive us. And how about our own souls? Are they not in need of revival? Are we really as near to the Lord as we should be? Are we so satisfied with the way things are that we, you know, think about the Lord for a couple of minutes, maybe a day, and then the rest of our time, we have little care or thought of God? Maybe we are doing better than many others. You say, I've been here for two services today, pastor. But is that really what it's like when we are revived, right? We would say more, more. I want more of Christ. And how many of us feel like Jacob, right? Our spirits bereaved, 
All these things are against me. My sin seems against me. The present state of the world is against me. Other things too. Our own individual souls need revival. We need God to come down and visit us. But this is a hopeful psalm, friends. Because in this psalm, what the people do is they remember that the Lord had shown them favor in times past. That things had been better once. And as such, they can be better again. This is not a hopeless psalm. It's a psalm that laments, but laments with hope of joy. Right? Lord, thou, verse 1, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have saved us. You have shown your mercy to the church of Jesus Christ. Here we are a people that the Lord had done great things for before. And here the same people are sensing his anger is kindled against them. Against his own people, against the people he had saved, they had felt his anger. And that certainly connects this psalm to our own state of affairs. Right? This was a land of great revival once. This, this very land, right? maybe not Texas particularly, but our nation. Right? We had seen the Lord do great things for us in the Great Awakening, the spread of evangelical religion that even seemed to reverse the tide of Unitarianism and deism in this land, where true gospel preaching was had. In the time of Whitfield and Edwards in the 18th century, true religion spread like wildfire and glory was dwelling among us. And our denomination, as it reaches back to the Psalm League and Covenant, had seen revival before. I would call the time of the Psalm League and Covenant a time of revival and the National Covenant before it. But now look at us. Look at our churches. Look at our nation. We ought to feel as Jacob with our spirit crushed and bereaved. Once glory dwelt in our land, but now it seems like all is Ichabod. The glory has departed. But if he has revived us before, he may revive us again. And that's the whole point of the psalm. And we are to plead with the Lord, revive us again. That is a crucial word. Again, O Lord, O God. So is there not a need, brethren, a great need for revival? Yes. Ought we not desire it to see these days of heaven on the earth again? And should we not be willing to seek it out and bear a cost that glory may dwell in our land? Yes, we must. You know, consider what the product of revival is if you are currently despondent. If you are weeping like Jeremiah over the ruin of Zion, the product of revival is in Psalm 85, verse 6, that thy people may rejoice in thee. There's joy here, right? When This is the fruit of revival, not just mourning over our sin, but the joy of the Lord that God has come down, right? And God has uh, brought the, the, the weight of our sin against us, but he has taken it away in Christ. And we feel the joy of knowing his presence among us and our burdens are removed in him. And it's not the ephemeral pleasure of worldly things that we will rejoice in, but the abiding pleasure and joy that is found in in heaven coming to earth. That thy people may rejoice where? In thee. Right? In revival, God is the joy of the people. And the things of God are our joy. And that's what we long for, or we ought to, is this joy in God alone. That we would taste Psalm 16 on the earth. In thy presence is fullness of joy. Well, lastly then, and we'll spend some time here, is determination. Uh, We must be determined, brethren, to exert ourselves for the sake of revival. Now, the first thing I I would say to this is, let us remember, you cannot manufacture a revival. It's a sovereign work of God coming down at his appointed time. So you might say, Pastor, this heading seems entirely suspect. But brethren, we must know that there are means and exertions that the Lord blesses, biblical ones. Right? And such exertions and the will to exert ourselves are the sign that the Holy Spirit is at work in us and perhaps preparing us for a time of revival. And when we are spiritually exercised, we don't see these exertions as exertions, but instead as our great privilege to serve the Lord and labor for the Lord and seek the Lord. Right? I'm always taken by the first disciples and how they saw their sufferings. Right? They saw it in this way, rightly, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. 
Right? When we exert ourselves for the sake of the Lord, we find it our joy that we were counted worthy to do so. And so when revival is nigh, the Spirit moves in God's people to exert themselves. And as you see here, the people of God are spiritually exercised in Psalm 85, and they are seeking the Lord, right? They're not just saying, well, when God revives his people, God will revive his people. It'd be nice, I suppose, if he would do it. No, they plead. They exert their soul in a heavenward direction, asking for it. So let me speak then on seven exertions for revival. And the very first exertion is prayer and the prayer meeting. You find that in our text itself. The people pray for revival, right? In verses 4 to 6, you find prayers such as, turn us, revive us, show us mercy. And the thing is, are these individual prayers? No, the word us, boys and girls, probably clued you in. These are corporate prayers. These are the people praying together. Turn us, revive us, show us, like the Lord's prayer itself. Our Father, which art in heaven, right? The Lord... Uh, mandates that we pray together. But especially when we think of God visiting his people in revival, what a strange thing it is, right, that we would seek revival for us as a people and not come together to pray as a people, not just individually, for revival. And let me just ask the question, where is the prayer meeting today, brethren? Where is it? How many churches even have a prayer meeting anymore? We say with much shame that ours did not for many years, many years, and that's to our shame. But even when the prayer meeting is instituted, how well attended are they? You know, if you need a thermometer for how the people may be revived, it can clearly be the prayer meeting itself. And what does the thermometer read today? Lukewarm, lukewarm, right? But when revival comes, it is because God's people have prayed earnestly for it. I don't have to give you a historical survey. Even in this nation, you have seen it. But the text itself, the Holy Scripture, shows you you are to pray for revival. These are prayers for revival. And you are to pray together as the people of God. And we are to pray whenever we can together for revival. But especially in the prayer meetings, we need to cultivate a gathered prayer among God's people. What is God's house itself called? Is it not called a house of prayer? How often is it a house of prayer anymore? It's almost like you would say it doesn't even describe the church, yet this is God's house. In the 19th century, it was a prayer meeting in New York started with a few businessmen that led to a great revival there. And for the ladies here, what a blessing it was to hear of a desire to pray after lunch together. These are the things that lead to revival. The Lord, and I'll just encourage you ladies, and it was interesting that a sister had decided to ask the question because it was already in the sermon that I was going to say, ladies, you need to pray together. It was two Gallic sisters before the Isle of Lewis uh, revival in their 80s that prayed before Duncan Campbell came. They prayed and prayed. And so it says also in that, it doesn't matter how old you are. If you're aged or you're young, you pray to the same God. And so you come together for united prayer. And Duncan Campbell arrived. The Lord sent him there. And the Lord powerfully blessed his ministry there. And we are also to have united prayer meetings. Right? We are not praying for the revival of the Dallas RPC. We're not praying for the revival of the RPCNA. We are praying for the revival of Christ's church. Whenever somebody names the name of Christ of a truth, who believes in the word of God, who believes in the gospel, when we encounter them, whether they're in the PCA, the OPC, the ARP, whether they're Reformed Baptist, or even non-Reformed, but they believe in the word of God and the truth of it, we are to unite together and pray together. And it has been united prayer of all of God's people that has been greatly blessed. Right? We are not schismatics. We are God's people. Go and pray with each other, brethren, and pray specifically for revival. Go as the widow to the unjust judge, not ceasing, not getting discouraged, and not stopping praying together. And the content of our prayers are also key, right? Uh, often in prayer meetings... I have nothing against praying for Aunt Bertha's cold, right? Please do. 
But when revival comes, it's the first three petitions of the Lord's Prayer that have the supremacy, right? People are praying, hallowed be thy name, O God. Uh, We pray thy kingdom come. We pray thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, right? These are the things. You want heaven to come down. You have to pray thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You want God to come down. Hallowed be thy name. And how is that going to happen? When the kingdom of God advances, thy kingdom come, right? Pray together, but never forget the place God has in the prayer meeting. He is supreme. And if we don't want God, right, we just want neighbor to be well and ourselves to have jobs, we won't be revived. Second exertion, we have to support the promiscuous preaching of Christ and Christ crucified. Evangelism will be in our heart. The preaching of the word will be in our hearts as well. We are to encourage ministers to take the preaching of the word outside of their buildings. And ministers must not be thought Uh, must not be of a mind to say, I can't do it, I'll be thought a fool if I do. They are to preach Christ, right? Not just Christ crucified, but Christ and Him crucified to the world. They must preach the free offer of the gospel, pleading with men on Christ's behalf. They must preach what is not popular, the depravity of man as sinner, the eternity of a torment uh, of hell, that sinners justly deserve. Not popular, but it must be preached. But also, the gracious and glorious cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the tenor of preaching before revival. And uh, those of us who are ministers must take it to places that have never heard it before, not just our people. And uh, I have always been taken by, and I've thought of this myself as I go into the open air preaching, Uh, consider how Whitfield preached. He once wrote, he was honored today with having a few few stones, dirt, rotten eggs, and pieces of dead cat thrown at me. This is where the man finds his honor. The ministers of God must exert themselves to preach everywhere. And you as God's people must encourage those that do and encourage those that don't to do it but also support them when they do. You know, donate resources to the effort of those who will go and preach Christ outside and be there when you can. And not just preaching, whenever they go into the highways and hedges and when God's people are of a mind to do it, support any of those efforts. And I would say generally there needs to be more preaching in our midst because revival begins in the house of God and the house of God needs more preaching. Um... Now, I'm going to take a portion of what I preach to the men of the RPCNA, which is, sadly, too many men, full-time men, and I'm caveating it this way, in the ministry now find it too burdensome to preach one sermon every week. One 30-minute sermon. I don't mean duplicating that sermon, that same sermon. I'm not talking about that, right? That, that still is preaching one sermon, as far as I'm concerned. But men find it too difficult to do that. And I was convicted at one point that I was only preaching two sermons every week. And so now we have three at the prayer meeting so that we may have more preaching. So morning Lord's Day, evening Lord's or afternoon Lord's Day like now, and then midweek as well. Because this has always been the Reformed tradition, whether Scots or Dutch. Three sermons a week, three unique sermons a week, three different sermons on the mind of God a week. I long for the day brothers and sisters, when religion was revived like at the Reformation, where there was preaching every day of the week. Every day of the week. You know, when the people say, forget streaming, I want preaching, and I want live preaching, and I want to worship God in the preaching. God's people, when they are revived, yearn for more preaching. And they are not content to hear just one this week. They cry out to the ministers, give us more. We want to hear more of Christ. We want to see our beloved out of the word. We want to know how to walk as a pilgrim in this world. Teach us and preach us all the counsel of God, pastor. The Bible is very big. Preach Christ to me out of it all. That's what the people want when they are revived. And the ministers must be earnest in the preaching and not detached. 
There is very little earnest preaching today. You know, if you go to Sermon Audio and you listen to a lot of our churches, right, you, you don't hear earnestness in the preaching, any sort of urgency in the preaching. Instead, it's very much like, well, this is what the text says, and, you know, it's very interesting how this connects with this here. But there is no earnestness. And you have to ask, where is the earnestness and urgency of 2 Corinthians 5.20 anymore? Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Two things, hearers here in preaching, which is blessed before revival. These are not unique to me. I don't remember where I heard this, but it's always stuck. First, that the ministers are earnest for their salvation that they know that the person, the man preaching, is earnest that they be saved. But second, more importantly, they know that God is earnest for their salvation through the preaching. That God is earnest that sinners be saved. Where is the zeal in preaching today? Not just preaching pretty sermons and doctrinally deep sermons, which are necessary, of course, not the pretty part, but the doctrinally deep part. But we need earnest preaching to mind and heart. You know, in verse 7, we see, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. Right? There's an earnestness there. In the great revivals of religion, it, the earnest preaching of Christ is central to it all. Third, the third exertion is to spend and be spent for Christ. You know, the Bible says, Woe to those that are at ease in Zion. Uh, especially the ministers. You know, revival comes when ministers especially are willing to spend themselves. When they put aside the worldly entertainment and amusements, when they spend themselves devoted to the work of the Lord in prayer and in the word, not to the neglect of their family. None of us have to ne must neglect our family for the Lord. He doesn't call us to sacrifice our fam families on the altar, so to speak. But let me just say, from experience, many of God's ministers today are worldly men. Worldly men, right? They speak in a worldly manner. They enjoy the things of this world too much, right? We are to enjoy a competent portion of the good things of this life. But too much is spent pursuing worldliness. Uh, it's okay to enjoy good things in this life. That's not what I mean. But their conversation is of the world, and you see it in their manner of life. But they are to exert themselves for the kingdom's sake, even when they are unloved for it. They are to have the heart of Paul, right? I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Uh, men don't do the work of the ministry that way, by and large, anymore. They preach something hard, they say something hard to turn the people to God. They're loved less, but they will say regardless, I will gladly do it. And that goes for all of us in all of our vocations. All of us are called on some level to exert ourselves for the kingdom, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Not as preachers, but in whatever we reasonably can, right? We are to serve God and serve neighbor and serve his kingdom, that Christ's kingdom would be uh, strengthened, that we might be revived, right? Not our works causing revival, but our heart uh, for God in the revival, uh, exerting ourselves, as an effect. The fourth exertion is to be spiritually exercised, right? Not being lukewarm when it comes to the Lord, but panting after him, panting after him ourselves, right? You, you open the psalm book. I have long thought on this. Uh, you look at the desire and the yearning here in these psalms that we sing exclusively. And, and the problem would be for you to look on that and say, well, that must be some kind of super Christian there. Is it? It's meant to be every Christian. Is that not why God has put it into the psalm book? To sing. You are to hunger and thirst after Christ. When you say, right, that there is... Uh, when you see David pant and thirst for the Lord, are you to say, wow, David was quite the Christian. I, I don't know anybody who could be that. No, this is what you are to desire for yourself, beloved. This is what you are to have yourself. You are not to be lukewarm when it comes to the Lord. If you are uh, uh, not exercised spiritually, if you're not fervent for the Lord, if you don't hunger for Him, do you think that revival will come? You'll not even want revival because you might be like the disciples from this morning, afraid of it. 
Let me just say, God's people can be afraid of revival because they know what it's going to cost them. Their sin, their amusements, their worldliness. They'll have to live for God when revival comes. But the more you know the refreshment of the Lord's presence in prayer and the other means of grace, how you will pray for revival, how you will engage yourself, you are to put the Lord first in your desires, brethren. You know, if a little bit of leaven leavens the lump, let me encourage you in this way. You would be amazed, and I have seen it myself, how one believer, quote unquote, on fire for the Lord, because they hunger for him, spreads zeal through a congregation, and suddenly now many are praying together and are seeking after the Lord together. It has happened. It has happened in this congregation, and it happened throughout the history of the kingdom. When you love the Lord and you seek him, that can spread. The fifth exertion for the church is reform. And that requires a great exertion, beloved, for we will have to contend with those or against those in the church in a brotherly way that are satisfied with present matters. Satisfied with doctrines not in accordance with the word of God and they will say, what's the big deal? We can't be satisfied with any doctrine against the word of God. We are to see doctrines and practices against the uh, word of God as doctrines and practices that Christ does not enjoy and Christ will not be a part of. And so we have to say, until we repent and reform, right? we cannot plead that Christ would come and visit us. So we are to reform our churches. We are not to be a church that is content with what we presently possess, but we are to seek more and more to be conformed to the mind and will of God. Why do you yearn for reform? Because reformation returns us to the Christ of the word. Would we even know Christ if we do not reform the church according to the word of God? We wouldn't. But when we reform our worship and our practice to the word of God, when we return to Christ, what do we read of in Malachi 3.7? The promise. Even from the days of your fathers, ye have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Okay, So here is a people who are not keeping the ordinances of God. But what does he say? Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Right, we are to reform the church and in our places, in our stations, right? This is predominantly on the backs of the ministers to, to labor for and the elders to labor for. But for all of us, right, we are to reform our own lives according to the word of God. We are to do whatever is in accord with the word and throw away everything else. And all the ordinances are to be kept in their purity, word, sacraments, and prayer, and, and their experimental nature as well. And I've tried to stress that throughout the ministry here, not just in the preaching, experimental preaching, we talk about it often, but there is an experimental piety to all the ordinances of Christ. Prayer feels dead in many of our churches. Prayer feels dead in many of our closets. Why? Because we do not really truly believe we are communing with the God of heaven. Our prayers become rote. Our minds go here, there, and everywhere else. It's only we're thinking about our work day, right? And we're no longer th- remembering that we are communing with God Almighty. And the sacraments in so many of our churches, especially the supper, feels like a ritual, and it's not an experimental uh, communion with Christ himself. You know, the recent RHB documentary on revival made me think on how often the Lord has brought revival in communion seasons, Right? You, you, in 1630, the Kirk of Shots revival with David Livingston was at a communion season, for instance, perhaps the most famous example of that. And what we need to do is bring back the sobriety and piety of the covenanters who celebrated communion with gravity and grace and anticipation that Christ would come down, right? It's not just the covenanters, but this is our, our tradition, our stream. You know, if we believe that the Holy Spirit brings Christ to us in communion, Let us conduct our communions in a manner suited for meeting with him. With preparation, prayer, and anticipation, pleading as we did at the prayer meeting before the Lord's Supper, come, Lord Jesus, come and visit us. Yet, the ordinances for God's people are often bare rituals, aren't they? How often are we earnest in our prayer to God to come down. We can have the form of a communion season. This is why they've all virtually disappeared in much of the church, because we can have the form of a communion season without the heart behind it. 
knowing why it is that we are to uh, um, have preparatory sermons that preach on repentance, on the beauty and glory of Christ, right? Who we say alone can fill our souls overflowing with love. Again, this is just tied to the fact that there's more preaching uh, before revival and in revival than uh, outside of it. Well, all that said, sixth, I have to go through these pretty quickly. Uh, Corporate repentance. Our psalm says, turn us again, or repent us, you know, essentially, turning us back to God. When revival comes, repentance comes. These two R's are linked, revival and repentance, right? We bewail our sins as a people and we come to the Lord. And what a blow that is to our pride. It'll cost us our pride and we ought to pay it. We as a people have to be willing to say we have committed iniquities, right? In all the revivals, this is always part and parcel of it, is that we have committed iniquities and we humble ourselves before God. The people prayed in verse four, turn us, O God, of our salvation and cause thine anger toward us to cease, right? When revival comes, as I've said, there's a greater sense of God's holiness. And we see that sin is not just an error, but it causes God's anger to be shown. And we have struck in our sin against the holiness of God. And so we have to repent of corporate sin in our churches, sins of both tables of the law. Verse 8 says, let them not turn to folly. God will speak peace to us. But we are told, don't turn to folly again. Don't return to it. Repent, truly. Associated with repentance, we are to consider our ways and fast when we can discover sin. Fasting is greatly blessed as we seek the Lord in revival. Now that goes for you in your own home, as well as this church and our denomination. Revival comes when God's people are from the heart ready to repent. You know, in 1830... Uh, before another revival, on account of appalling moral depravity prevailing, quote, the parish in Kilsyth appointed a fast day. How often when we see moral depravity do we appoint a fast day? You know, we often fast because we want this, the Lord to fill our pulpits, or uh, maybe we are fasting and praying for somebody who's on death's doorstep, and those are good, good things. But how often are we fasting, right? Fasting is connected, if nothing else, to sin, Right? And, I, and I fear that our ordinances are turning into uh, a kind of bare, well, let's try fasting, let's try prayer. Right? These are sort of like, oh, well, will God look down on us and say, because these people are fasting, then I will have to show them favor. Right? We almost become papists, don't we, with the ordinances. I will say my ten Hail Marys and my five Our Fathers, and that will do something. But no, that's not how God is. God wants our heart in it. In the fast days of the exiles, God asked in Zechariah 7, 5, when ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, so this is a regular fast, even those 70 years, do you remember the question? Did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? Did you do it for me? Or did you just do it to do it? If we want God to come, we have to do these things for God with our heart engaged. So much of our religious activity is mere formality. Our heart's not torn over the sins of our land and our people. We want God to come down, so we must rend our hearts and not our garments in fasting. Seventh and lastly, we need to be ready to be sacrificial with our resources. Whenever revival comes, the people of God are ready to freely give their resources for the sake of the kingdom. Do you remember, beloved, the difference between when David gathered the materials for the first temple and when Haggai gathered, uh, or in Haggai's time, the temple was to be rebuilt. What was the difference? The people of God in David's time were freely giving of their substance, such that David is astonished at how much the people gave freely, willingly, without compulsion. God, of course, loving a cheerful giver. But what about Haggai's time? Do you remember? They built their own homes instead of the temple of God, right? And what was the difference? Religion was revived in David's time, but religion was on the doorstep of death in Haggai's time. In Haggai, listen to this. The people made excuses. The time has not come 
the time that the Lord's house should be built. So it's not time to build the Lord's house. But the question is, is it not time, beloved, to build the house of God? Is there ever a time in which the Lord's house ought not to be built? And I'm not talking about building projects. Right? Today, the church worships in spirit of truth, not in particular locations. But what a thing it is, right, that, that the church often struggles. And I'm not talking about the mega church. I'm talking about true gospel preaching churches. Christ said he will build his church, and he says to us, it is time to build. And we ought to give sacrificially to God's causes. It's a sad and shocking thing that the Republican Party probably gets more of God's people's tithes, or money, I should say, than the church does. But who is the actual agent that the Lord blesses? Where does revival begin? In the house of the Republican Party? No. Revival begins in the house of God, as does judgment. So seven exertions for revival, more could be listed. But if we truly longed for times of refreshment to come from the presence of the Lord, which is what happens, if there were truly none else that we have in heaven but Christ, and no one else that we desire above him on the earth but him, we would exert ourselves and put away our lukewarmness. And so we are to cry out to our God in prayer, Turn us, O God of our salvation. Wilt thou not revive us again? He has done it before. In our brief time, I've listed revivals in four different centuries. Will he not do it again? O ye of little faith, surely he will. Why is this psalm again in our psalm book to sing and pray if not? Do you think he gives you this psalm for no reason and no purpose? No, he gives it so that we would plead with the God of heaven, praising him, even as we sing it, that he would revive us again. And so let us exert ourselves without discouragement, even if revival comes not in our time, it will come. Let us just be faithful to the Lord and not lose heart in the meantime. Amen. May God help you and me desire such revival. Let us arise for prayer. O Lord God of heaven, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come, that you would come and meet us, O Lord. Help us to put away our lukewarmness. Help us desire revival, knowing that in the desire for revival, what we are saying, O God, to you is we desire thee. That's what we want. We want God. And yet our hearts are so far away, and yet we are often reserved when we say it. Even now, many of our hearts are not entirely in it. So, Father, we pray that you would do a great work in the people of God, that we would desire revival, that we would desire with a whole heart God's presence, knowing what it will cost us, especially our sin and our worldliness, to enjoy the presence of God, but give your people who long for heaven. We say we long for heaven, and yet we are reserved when we say, give us heaven on earth. So, Father, we pray that you would revive our churches and our nation, whether they be the Reformed Presbyterian Church or all of our brethren who love the Lord of a truth and desire to follow the word of God. Revive all these churches that we may be one in due time, for when Revival comes, the oneness of the people of God comes too, we know, so that we will not be so many different tribes scattered abroad, but we may be one people once again under one King, King Jesus. Do this, O Lord, and cause us to desire it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.